Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for taking the time to join our panel today. Again, I'm Samantha Marr, the author liaison for Rutledge Education Books. And today we are here to discuss a powerful, practical series of books we have growing here at Routledge, the Equity and Social Justice in Education series. We have six of our series authors here to discuss their books. We're also joined by series editor and fellow author Paul C. Gorski, who is going to be moderating our panel today. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Paul, to introduce yourself and all of our authors. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it's such an honor to be here with this amazing group of people. It's just making me think back to when the, when we first got the series rolling. And it's so amazing to see where it's gone with uh, all these like scholars and educators that I uh, who I admire so much. So it just kind of tickles me to be here with all of you at once. I'm a little overwhelmed actually. So I wonder if we could start uh, maybe just by you all uh, introducing yourselves, maybe giving a shout out to co-authors, if you have co-authors, and uh, and saying maybe just a little bit about your book and, and uh, the title and what you would say is the purpose of your book. And then we'll go into some, some uh, broader questions about your books and the state of education uh, today. So uh, Noreen, would you like to get us started? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Noreen Nassim Rodriguez, and um, I have the privilege of having written two books for this series. The first one um, is Social Studies for a Better World, which is co-authored with Katie Swalwell. My social studies soulmate is what I typically refer to her as. And um, I can talk about this more later, but uh, we spent years as teacher educators looking for the perfect text to use in our social studies methods courses for elementary and early childhood uh, teacher candidates. And we were just cobbling together all these different articles and readings and we couldn't find anything that was like certainly oriented around social justice and also gave our students the tools they needed to learn how to be great social studies teachers. So as Toni Morrison said, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must write it. So that's what this book is. And similarly, um, that same kind of motivation was behind the creation of my second book, which came out in December, uh, Teaching Asian America in Elementary Classrooms, written with Soyan An and Esther Kim, who are uh, very dear friends and colleagues that I've been doing a lot of work with for the last decade around Asian America, um, particularly how to teach about Asian America through children's literature and primary sources. Um, and there are a few resources out there or in progress for high school and college level teaching about Asian America, but there's nothing really substantive that takes a critical stance that's contemporary, uh, looking at Asian America in terms of teaching it across disciplines to young children. So that's what we put together here. Thank you. The books are so, I'm gonna say this about everyone's books because all your books are so good. But I just, all I can think of, these books are so good. If you all haven't read those two books, uh, you really should read them. They're, amazing, both in their voice and in the, the content. So amazing. Uh, how about Manya? You want to talk a little bit about your? Sure, you? thank you. I'm Manya Whitaker. My book is Public School Equity, Educational Leadership for Justice. Um, came out in 2022 originally. Um, I am actually a developmental educational psychologist. Um, so as a teacher educator, I approach a lot of what I work on and what I educate pre-service teachers through a lens of why and not necessarily what. Um, and so this book was, you know, my my attempt to give educators kind of a comprehensive approach to why educational equity sometimes doesn't work the way we think it should work. Um, and I wanted them to think about building an entire system around equity rather than ad hoc pieces that tend not to be effective because they only address one cog in the wheel. So I talk about things from organizational structures, grading practices, curriculum, teacher evaluation, um, and even career advancement, uh, because the entire system needs to, to have equity at the center or the strategies undermine themselves. So my approach is very much of centering the cognitions behind what does and does not work in public school systems. Awesome. 
and that book is so good. Sorry, I'm going to say that about every book because uh, I think all the books are good. Uh, thank you uh, so uh, so much for that. And and I believe your book was either the first or second one that we signed in the in the uh, series. Uh, how about uh, Shauna? Hi, hi everyone. My name is Shauna Coppola and my book is Literacy for All, a framework for anti-impressive teaching. Um, and like Noreen, I wrote the book that I wish that I had <laughs> as a teacher. Um, and it just uh, uses a, a framework uh, created out of five different principles that help us really see and practice our literacy teaching through um, uh, an anti-oppressive just lens. Um, and one of the things that I really wish that I had known before, <laughs> which is why I wrote the book, was I was just, I think about how I was always one of those teachers who was lamenting that the system is broken, the system is broken. And when I realized finally that the, especially the U.S. public school system was working exactly as it was intended, it changed my entire practice as a literacy educator. And so um, my hope is that folks are able to read this and just sort of rethink some of their assumptions about literacy and literacy teaching. Thank you. And it's so good. I, I, if I remember correctly, I wrote to you and I was surprised you hadn't written a book about equity yet. I was like, hey, uh, so, so glad to have that uh, book uh, in this series. Uh, Alex? Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Chevron Vanette. I had the honor of having my first book be the first one out in this series, and um, that was pretty exciting. So, my first book here is equity centered trauma informed education and when paul put out the call for series proposals I, I remember one of the asks being let's take some of these buzzwords and really look at them through a justice lens and uh, there's not much of a buzzier buzzword than trauma informed education and so my book is less about um you know, there was a lot out there already about trauma-informed education in this kind of deficit way of, oh, let's feel really sad for all these kids. And mine instead is really asking, what if we took the concept of trauma and um, in a really justice-oriented way, looked at how we should transform schools through that lens? Um, and then I have a new book coming out in two weeks uh, called Becoming an Everyday Changemaker comes out on April 1st. And this is really, um, in a lot of ways, a follow up to the first one. A lot of people read my first book and said, that's nice, Alex, but I'm just one teacher. How am I supposed to make change given my district leadership and these state laws and the general environment? And I don't know how to really go about all this. And so I tried to take this idea. I've read so many books about school change and leadership that are like, if you just do these couple of steps and convince these people, then it's all going to be great. And so I'm really looking at it through this, again, through this trauma and justice lens of um, how does change actually work? What are some of the justice oriented tools we can use? Um, and is really supposed to be a little bit of a guide for that teacher who says, I want to make change and I don't really know where to get started. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Jenna? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenna Chandler Ward. I am the co author of Learning and Teaching While Light Anti Racist Strategies for School Communities. My co author is Elizabeth Denevi. Um, and again, we wrote the book that we wish we had because we feel that as white teachers uh, in white systems, we were causing a lot of harm. And neither of us were really required to take a look at our own identity and how it was impacting our teaching. And so we wrote the book we wish we had. And as Shauna said, the system is working as designed. And so we really wanted to turn a light on what is that system if schools were created for and by white people. Um, why are we never talking about whiteness when we talk about race and education? And what is the baseline that everything is being judged from? Where did that come from? Um, so that's really the emphasis of our book and trying to shine a light on the system so we can stop talking about fixing kids 
and look at how the system is designed to fail kids. Thank you. These books are all so good that I mentioned that. <laughs> Uh, so last but not least, I've, I've been saving Justin uh, 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 for last because uh, your book is uh, coming out soon. I think I guess it's the, the next one that uh, the, the cover we just landed on a cover, and uh, I'm so excited about this book. Just the writing in it is beautiful. The content is powerful. It's very narrative. Uh, it's uh, it's so good. <laughs> so do you, would you like to talk a little bit about, about your book that we'll be seeing soon? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, so I'm Justin or JPB Gerald. The author name is JPB on there, but I can't change my team's display name. Uh, anyway, the book is called Embracing the Exceptions, uh, Meeting the Needs of Neurodivergent Students of Color. Um, can't hold it up because it's not out yet, uh, but, you know, they're going to flash the image later. Anyway, so why did I write the book? Well, the, the short answer is that I myself got diagnosed with ADHD when I was 35, which was two years ago, two and a half, whatever. Um, and I started looking at research. You know, I'd been looking into it beforehand. That's how I got the evaluation. And I realized that everything about the group of neurodivergent people of color or students of color was either too broad or too narrow, right? It was either neurodivergence in general, which would tend to favor one group of people, or it was about students of color in general, but it wasn't really talking about that intersection, or it was so narrow that it was specifically like autism in girls of color, right? This is a valuable group and it's in the book to some extent, but that sort of middle ground between neurodivergence, which is a broad category, and students of color, which is obviously an extremely broad category, it didn't really exist. If you want this research, you have to go either deep into academic journals and piece it together, and you can't get any stories. You just get, you know, underdiagnosis statistics, statistics, uh, statistics for you know the harm that comes to us, and it does. And I just wanted to tell our stories um, about us, for us, and by us, so that the teachers and I assume everyone reading really wants to do right by us can hear what we have to say, what we experience, and what we wish would have gone differently. And hopefully future writing and research can come of it so that it isn't the only thing in that intersection. Awesome, thank you. Uh, these books, now I wanna read all these books again. So um, I'm just gonna start asking some questions. I, I don't think we're gonna get through this full list of questions, but that's okay, because I would love any kind of back and forth and engagement rather than let's just each take turns responding to everything. And I, I'm gonna kind of, I know I sent you all a list of questions. I, I'm, I'm not gonna start at the top because we kind of talked about that already. So I, I wanna start with one that might create some conversation. Uh, what would you say is a common misunderstanding about equity and justice in schools today? A misunderstanding, a misapplication, uh, um, an ideological blockage. And, and I wonder if you could talk about maybe just in general, but also maybe in terms of your book, uh, what, what are the deeper understandings that people need in, in, in order to get to solutions, transformations, reimaginings that uh, are truly going to uh, make a difference rather than being more uh, performative or mitigative? Anyone can feel free to jump in. I'll jump in first. Um, yeah. I love this question because I think those of us who are teacher educators hear a lot of these kind of misconceptions all the time and we do our best to battle them. Um, and for me, one of the uh, one of the most important misunderstandings um, in the world of educational equity is that a strong principle is enough to make an inequitable schooling system equitable. Right. We know and we accept that students need individualized educational approaches, but for some reason we still think that teachers can benefit from a one size fits all principle. 
So my book does explore in a couple chapters different leadership styles in the context of other school factors like the climate, community partnerships, um, onboarding processes, so that teachers can best assess if and to what extent they can be successful in a particular school, right? Because like a transformative leader may be great for some. Right. But others like myself may benefit more from a more behavioristic approach or a transactional leader who has clear and consistent expectations, their rewards, there's consequences for performance. Um, so I guess in all, just like students need different types of support, so do teachers. And my book pushes teachers to think through what they need to be their best teacher selves. And I guess I'm, I'm basically saying that it's OK to think about yourself and not just your students when you think about equity. I'll jump in and talk about teachers specifically. So um, I think in both of the books that I've co-authored for this series, we're really clear about the fact that just having more diverse representation is not it. Like that is not equity and justice. If you have the founding fathers and then you add Betsy Ross, like that is not making sure that you are including women in any sort of meaningful way. Um, in Social Studies for a Better World, we identify four problematics, which we describe as things that teachers commonly do when they think they're trying to be more inclusive and teaching for justice, um, but are actually just reinforcing the status quo. And then we offer solutions for them to do better. And we try to be really honest about the fact that we too have made a lot of these mistakes. In fact, we identify some of those mistakes very specifically and we're like, this is terrible. We should not do that. And please don't do this if you're doing it too. Um, but we have one chapter on what we describe as heroification, where, for example, during the civil rights movement, we always highlight Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and then at the elementary level, Ruby Bridges. And the focus is on individuals all the time and how there are these incredible people who did amazing things, which studies have shown can be really intimidating to children when you're simply highlighting the incredible actions and bravery of a, of a single individual. But also, if we're talking about the civil rights movement, why are we ignoring the movement and the fact that it's about mobilizing people for the common good? And so um, we really try to highlight things that teachers are doing out of great intentions, but the impact is still harmful. The impact is still not actually sh shifting the dominant narratives that we teach and that we, we instill in students, um, sometimes not necessarily through the curriculum, but through the ways that we address them. If we say, okay, we're going to line up now, boys and girls, I need boys over here, girls over here. That's still norming two ways of being in terms of gender, right? And so we try to give as many clear examples of that as possible in that book. And then similarly, in Teaching Asian America, um, we are not saying you need to just add an Asian face or just bring in this Asian biography, and then you will have your diverse um, set of historical figures, and now you've achieved equity. We have to think about, again, these common narratives that are taking place in classrooms. So is it all about meritocracy and the American dream and the U.S. is the land of opportunity? Or are we thinking about the ways that in, 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 in order to benefit capitalist enterprises, particular groups were brought to the United States because they were easy to exploit? And then as soon as they were no longer needed for their labor, they were no longer viewed as desirable and excluded, like the Chinese in the 1800s, right? And so... We really try to outline ways that, OK, we know you're trying, but we're not actually shifting the narrative or disrupting the narrative in any meaningful way. And so we try to offer solutions that will do those things. I'd like to build on that. Oh, go ahead. OK, uh, what I think is is. Um, something that both my book challenges and that is I find to be a frustrating aspect, especially of when I go to like conferences or whatever and I see teachers there, um, is this sort of an understandable but limiting belief that there's going to be like an end. Like if you do this for like I've gotten to the end of the equity or anti-racism or whatever it is, right? And, you know, I did that. I can move on. I think we all know and anyone watching this is going to understand that a quick fix isn't good, but still like even just like and then you're finished is going is part of the issue. Right. So in my book, I try to look the book has to end. Right. The chapters have to end. But like I really didn't want to give people the impression that even if you try all of the things in the book and there are a lot of things in there, you're going to be done. It's 
pointing towards the start of what I hope for the teachers who read it and want to do better is going to be a basically endless iterative process. And if you aren't up for that, then frankly, you're not going to be able to support the people who are being excluded or oppressed or whichever we'd like to say. So go ahead, Jenna. No, thank you. Um, I just was thinking about the myth that if we talk about race, that we cause guilt and shame. And I think what we try to say in our book is it's not talking about race that causes guilt and shame, particularly for white kids. And that building on what you said, Noreen, most students that we interviewed, the first time they heard the term white was when in kindergarten, they learned a white person shot Dr. King, right? But they've never heard the term white or whiteness prior to that. So we really want to think about not in terms of whitewashing history in any way, but how can we name whiteness outside of the context of oppressor and oppressed? And how are students of color seeing themselves outside of that paradigm as well? And thinking about how do we model white anti-racism for white students? How do we offer examples of white anti-racist? How do we show cross-racial solidarity? Where are we teaching that, making it explicit? And so that we're seeing multiple ways of being white and not just talking about whiteness within that context of oppressor and oppressed. So hoping that the more we talk about race, the less guilt and shame kids are feeling instead of we're only talking about it in that context. Anyone else wanna jump in on this one? Other question. Well, one thing I, I just wanna mention here is, the thing that I'm, I'm, I think is amazing about, uh, well, really all the books in, in the in the series, is this. Uh, there's there's directness, and naming the things that need to be named, but there's also, in in most of the books at least, all, I think all the books to some extent a kind of humility, and self reflection, so that as authors you're kind of in a way aligning yourself with the readers like i'm tri i've tripped over myself too and i and here's how i've tripped over myself and i think that's such a great way to kind of establish connection so it doesn't feel like i am the expert on high and i'm gracing you with this <laughs> piece of expertise it's like you know we're, we're all to some extent tripping over ourselves uh, sometimes trying to figure our way through the equity and justice thing. And uh, um, I, I really value that about uh, about the, the books in the series. Um, I'm, I, I hope you all don't mind. I'm kind of jumping all over this list of questions. But uh, the whole, one that I just really want to hear you all share a little bit about or whoever's comfortable sharing about it is, um, you know, in, in today's the sort of political climate today where educators in some regional context might be punished uh, for uh, advocating for equity and justice or for trying to implement some of the things you all talk about uh, in your books. How, how can we as authors or as part of the community of people who are putting these ideas out into the world, what are, what's some support that we can offer or that you can offer or some insight? Uh, I think that's becoming a bigger and bigger group of people who want to do what you're challenging them to do in your book, but aren't going to get institutional support to do it. Um, I can start on that one. Um, I think one thing that I've heard from readers is that simply talking about the things we're talking about and putting them in writing and having them published has been helpful because we have a lot of uh, education leaders and policymakers kind of weaponizing this idea of evidence-based and research-based. And so, you know, for example, in my first book, I have a section in there about 
um, PBIS, which is a really common um, behavior management framework. And I talk about the problems with it. And I've heard from so many people about it's so helpful to me that I can go to my district and say, look in this book. <laughs> it's saying this thing that I'm thinking. And so I think just kind of documenting some of that um, can be really helpful. But then I also think in our work, we can be real with folks about what are some of the different ways into the work um, and what are some of the considerations. Um, in my new book, I have a section about about how do you take on risk as an educator and how should you think about that? I interviewed some different educators about this and um, one of them, Lorena Herman, who's an amazing equity leader, um, said this amazing quote, she said, you know, we don't need martyrs, we need teachers in the classroom and sort of to really be thinking about what's your role, um, where do you want to be in the work and how is your action going to support you or not support you. And I have not really read a lot of books that have that kind of honest discussion about um, how we step into things. And I think something I love about our whole series is that every book I've read in it um, we're just pretty real with the reader. <laughs> we're not pulling a lot of punches. We're not trying to, you know, hide things under academic language. And I think that that is really helpful to folks. I agree, Alex. And in the spirit of not pulling any punches, um, one of the things that I talk to folks about who ask me this question is I bring up, and I bring this up in my book too, that um, I offer a reminder that, you know, we're in a profession where almost 70% of us are white. Um, and there's a lot of social and professional capital um, that folks who have that protection of whiteness can use to push back um, on injustice and inequitable practices. And it really resonates with me. I'm a, I'm a, um, I live in New Hampshire right now, and anyone who's following New Hampshire knows that it's just continuing to get worse and worse and worse here um, in terms of equity and, and humanization. Um, and um, one of the things that I hear a lot from teachers in this state, um, especially with new um, legislation, fairly new legislation that has created a chill uh, in the classroom for folks to do um, work that's really grounded in equity um, is that they, I hear, I'm, I'm so scared, I'm so scared. And I understand that on, uh, on one level and on another level, having done some, a lot of consulting work and coaching work for many years, I can say with all confidence that this wasn't happening before that legislation either. Um, or when it was happening, it was happening really infrequently. Um, and so I just think that we really have to think about how do we use our, you know, social and professional capital to push back um, and to take risks, like Alex said. Um, and, and also, we're never going to change the hearts and minds of everybody. Um, so it's really important to think about our spheres that, of influence. Uh, I think a lot of folks feel nervous about engaging in anti-oppressive work because they don't have the, the language necessarily to push back. Um, and so doing some of that internal work is really important too. So like at the end of every chapter in my book, I have work um, strategies and activities for people to do that's more internal, interpersonal work and also external work and strategies. So um, yeah, not pulling punches. <laughs> So I'm from Texas and Katie lives in Iowa. I lived in Iowa at the time that we wrote Social Studies for a Better World. Part of why I left Iowa is because I am also a critical race scholar and they banned it two weeks after I moved out of state. So these 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 concerns about being attacked, being doxxed, being trolled, it's happened to Katie and I because of the book, as Paul knows. Um, but I also know that it's happening to a lot of the people that I used to teach with, right? And the people that are teaching now. So we actually have a chapter in our book called How to Teach Anti-Oppressive Social Studies Without Getting Fired. And Katie and I are in the middle of doing a second edition of the book and we're doing a couple things. So that was chapter eight in the in the version that's currently out. We're moving it up to the beginning because we have a lot of pre-service teachers that are terrified and they start reading the book and they're like, uh, we don't actually think we can do any of these things where we are. Because we, this, our book is being used in teacher ed programs across the country and in Canada, including in Texas. 
including in Iowa. And so we know that even if this is the book that their professors are giving them to read, they're still in states where they're seeing on the news regularly that teachers are losing their jobs. So we want to forefront that in our second edition that should hopefully be coming out in 2025. But then the other piece that we're doing um, is, I mean, I think we offer really good advice um, around specifically what Shauna just mentioned, like doing what you can in your spheres of influence, finding your people. We offer resources. Um, we offer various suggestions for those kinds of support. Remember who you're fighting for. Um, but in the second edition, we're going to be really intentional about interviewing people who have been fired or who have been pushed out um, across the country. And we actually just sent out in invitations for interviews uh, two days ago. So we want to be able to offer advice, but we also know that neither one of us was teaching right now, right? And so we want to hear from people that are going through this in this particular moment. And um, so hopefully that will be useful because we're going to ask them both for their advice for new and current teachers and also who supported you and would you have done anything differently? Because some of these people that we've already started to be in conversations with are like, I did the right thing. I can sleep at night. This school district was not doing the right thing for all children and I stood my ground and I'm okay with that. And we know not everyone can say that, right? Like some people have the privilege of being able to have the, you know, the savings or the flexibility to look for another job and some people don't. And so we're hoping that these interviews will give readers a lot more insight into the realities of, of dealing with these challenges right now, knowing that um, as much as we try to inspire folks, like in this current climate where there's book bans and people being trolled, just for trying to make sure that every single one of their students and those families feel seen. Um, we, we also wanna just offer as much practical advice from people who are in the classroom. And so hopefully the next edition will um, support people even more than, than the current one does. I think that um, I'm in an interesting position with mine, which obviously hasn't come out yet, but, but um, a lot of the book almost all of the book really is reflections from people who were once students. Some of them are still students, although so they're adults. Um, and it honestly, although it doesn't pull punches, it's a, a gentler book than I was expecting to write. Um, I'm not, to be clear, sugarcoating anything, right? I don't do that. Uh, but I think that my approach and based on what they told me in the interviews because that's ultimately where you go is what they say um was that a lot of what uh they would have wanted in their intersections neurodivergent students of color was a lot of patience and understanding um and i'm not saying patience and understanding is going to roll back book bans that's not what i'm saying <laughs> but i am saying in terms of internal work right that like even the ones who are already trying to do things right will lose their patience, right? And will categorize people in ways that they may not have wanted to. And so I think I'm actually surprised that, uh, because I know how I am in my personality. Like I thought I was, I was gonna be out there jabbing, but like it, it ends up being something and people can tell me if they agree once they read it. Um, you know, something that I think they might be able to take the stories in and use them to, even where things are really hostile, um, impact their classrooms, impact their schools, because ultimately, and it's a lot more than that, I'm oversimplifying, um, it's something that I think may actually be slightly more universal than I thought it would be. Like, I'm, I'm really surprised, because my first book, which is an academic book, it is not universal. <laughs> but, but this one, you know, it, it actually might, be able to be used there. Anyone else have something to share on that? I would just add that um, that we need to keep the context that these attacks aren't new. They've been happening since the very beginning. And as educators, we should know that clearly um, education is a place that people are worried about and we actually hold more power than maybe we feel like we do um, because education is always the target, which tells us how much power we actually have. And I think these attacks are designed to make us feel alone and that it's a losing battle. And I think um, 
as Noreen said, just maybe even reading it in a book that we're out here. And so finding your people, finding ways to come together. It's a lot harder to argue with many teachers than it is being a single teacher standing up. Um, where are your people? How do we stand together in solidarity? And just know that this is part of the historical context that's existed since the beginning of naming this country what it's named. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember this, but um, there was, in some ways, similar blowback even when it was called multicultural education. Um, I, I was getting threats. Uh, people were getting threats around that. That was in the like '90s, late '80s, early '90s. Uh, it's pretty. So, so it's like. There's like wave, it's always there, and there are waves when it gets a lot stronger and almost normalized. Uh, yeah, I, I was being banned from states in the 90s. <laughs> uh, and, and when stuff was framed around multicultural education, which seems so fluffy now uh, in retrospect, but uh, it's interesting. I, I, I'm, a couple of you have kind of alluded to this, but I'm wondering. What, what you all are hearing about, about how your book is being used. In, in other words, have you heard anything about it being used for like professional development where groups of people are uh, uh, using it or is it, are you hearing mostly from individual people who are like, wow, this, this is amazing uh, or other things? I know some of your books have been adopted in, like, like well, Noreen mentioned, like in court and for uh, um, at universities for course adoptions. Uh, but any other or interesting ways you've heard about it, your your books being used or portions of your books? I was surprised, and I, I don't know why, but I was surprised to hear that um, a lot of school districts. Um, had adopted my book, particularly um, around my chapters about identifying equity minded teachers. Um, and I know it's because this is the chap, these are the chapters where I really lean into my psych background. Um, and people are responding to the distinction I make between teaching quality and teacher quality. Right, because most of our recruitment and hiring processes focus on the former, you know, what teachers do. But I'm encouraging principals and district leaders to focus on teachers' belief systems because we know that it's the beliefs that guide their behaviors. You know, teachers know what to say in an interview to describe their instructional approach, right? They know all the buzzwords they're supposed to, to use, but it's much more difficult to fake your core values and your worldview and your belief systems, particularly because those vary in different social settings, depending upon how your identity markers intersect with those of your students, their families, um, your colleagues, right? Um, and so I, I spent a lot of time talking about what we should be assessing and that teacher interviews must therefore tap into cognitive and affective teaching motivators. Um, and I give lists of things that people can look for in those processes. So that part I think is really resonating with folks who do the hiring. Um, as I mentioned, our book's been used in teacher prep programs um, and not just elementary, which is pretty awesome. Social studies for a better world. Sorry, let me be specific. Um, so last count, over 50 teacher preparation programs in the U.S. and Canada were using it as the main course, like text in the course, which is incredible and kind of surreal. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, not the thing that I find confusing, and Manya, I, I guess this is normal if people are just using one or two of your chapters. Not everyone's using the whole book. So I'm like, well, we wrote it in order. We want, like, things build. Um, so I'm always curious as to why people would just pick a few chapters and not the whole thing. That's the thing I would love to know more about. Um, and then with uh, Teaching Asian America, uh, the new book with Soyeon and Esther Kim, we're actually about to start a book tour. We've been sponsored by an organization called the Asian American Foundation um, that's working on supporting the various states that have been passing mandates for the teaching of Asian American histories across the U.S. There's the numbers keep growing. Wisconsin just passed a mandate. 
on Wednesday. So um, we have connections in these places and there's a lot of enthusiasm, particularly among Asian American teachers and um, elementary school leaders around getting PD so that we can start teaching these things to young children as soon as possible, rather than waiting for the mandates to be official and in the law, like people are already looking for professional development. So the fact that that's happening is a dream come true. And um, we're just really excited that that it isn't just like a one off. We're going to come do a PD and then that's all you get. But they can actually refer to the book and we're building out the website because I think one thing I've learned from social studies for a better world and and, you know, the rest of the folks, please chime in um, is the website for the book has been really useful for people. And so I'm just trying to figure out like what are ways that we can leverage what's in the book and then add additional resources to the website so that the conversation isn't over. Um, I feel like the days of bulletin boards uh, are, are over, but I kind of wish that we had more spaces like that so that people who are interested in the topics that they're reading about in our books could connect more online in some virtual spaces um, to build communities around like their shared interests in developing these ideas that we've all written about and then actually executing them in classrooms. Really quickly off the top of your head, can you name some of the places where the book tour is going in case you might end up so people who are there might look for it? Yeah, so um, we're going to be in Philadelphia in April for the American Educational Research Association Conference. So we're doing some work with Philadelphia School District. Um, and then we're going to be in Seattle at the end of April. And so we're doing some work at the University of, Wisconsin, of Washington Bothell with our dear friends Wayne Al and Sarah Shear. We're going to work with some pre-service teachers there. And then we're in the process of figuring stuff out with folks in Atlanta in August and Wisconsin and Illinois in September and October. So we're still working things out. The dates will be on our website, teachingasianamerica.com in the coming months. So we're super excited. Reach out if, if folks are interested. Thank you. I've also um, uh, heard about my book being used in a lot of teacher uh, prep programs and district book studies. A really cool experience around the teacher ed program was that one uh, College of Education kind of redesigned their whole course progression around some of the themes in my book so that it wasn't just in one class. It was really threaded through, which was pretty amazing. Um, and then also, I'm curious if other people have had this experience, but some of the places my book has gone besides K-12 schools has been cool. There's been um, a medical school and a couple of schools of nursing that have been really interested. Um, I've, you know, seen it just kind of uh, been taken up in some of these other places where people are teaching, but maybe it's it's not a K-12. But, you know, my book has been cited and things about drama, um, you know, community theater and music education. And so that's been really neat as well. Anyone else? Uh, we've had some school districts who've been doing a slow read, so doing a chapter a month, and then um, sometimes Elizabeth and I zoom in for a quick check in around that chapter, questions that came up. Um, and I know a lot of administrative teams are using it to sort of identify areas for strategic implementing, uh, you know, where to put their efforts and funding. Um, but we also have a chapter for parents, so it showed up a lot in parent teacher associations. Some school boards have been reading it, particularly ones that are entirely white, of which there are far too many. Um, same with administrative teams. And so I think um, particularly in areas where they recognize there is not representation, how do we at least take a step forward to look at ourselves so that we maybe could become more attractive to candidates of color who to join a administrative team or a school board or any any school institution. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I have a I think just one or two more questions that I'll put out there. But so one thing I'm going to ask, this is maybe a, I don't know, a kind of writer, author kind of question. One thing I'm really interested in that, that also I think people who are interested in your books might be interested in is the moments when we're writing and we come to a point that we realize we have to make that 
maybe hadn't occurred to us until we were like in the process of writing and something jumped out. Of I wonder if anyone has an example of that, like uh, something, a, a point or argument you you made in the book that just sort of came to you in the process of the writing, something that, that might be of interest to potential readers, uh, an important or unique uh, argument or insight that, that that made its way into your book. Um, I can I can speak to that. One of the things that um, you know I write about is how uh, just our very concepts of what literacy is or what it means to be literate are really grounded in white mainstream neurotypical practices um, and how can we completely disrupt that and be so much more inclusive in our practice um, and one of the things that I started looking into more in kind of reflecting on my own literacy practices growing up and how I was socialized around literacy around speaking writing reading is that the varies in which my uh, and other sort of white mainstream families uh, ask questions even is echoes the way that a lot of uh, questions are asked in, in a lot of classrooms. They're called known answer questions where you would say something like, um, you know, what what are the um, what are the the uh, who are the authors of the book that we are reading right now and what did they say about such and such where the teacher knows the answer um and in a in a home environment that might look like you know what do we need to do when we get ready for our bath um and they're not really these questions where we're um sincerely asking <laughs> um and and that's just one small example of all of the ways that u.s public schools especially really echo and privileged white mainstream ways of talking, um, speaking, writing, listening, reading. Um, and th so that was just a really big aha moment for me. <laughs> One thing that I noticed, um, you know, I planned out the book uh, according to common traits of neurodivergent people, students, you know, um, ideally to sort of flip them on their heads because these traits are used as sort of deficits against us. But that I knew that's not a surprise. I planned that. Um, and then I knew I was going to have to talk a little bit how to take the lessons from the book and apply them to IEPs, because like not only was I specifically asked to do that, <laughs> but also if someone would come and read the book and say, OK, but I have to do this thing. Right. Uh, and so I said, I don't want to think about this. I'm just going to write the book first. I wrote all the chapters and then I said, let me actually go and do what I said I was going to do and look at the IEP stuff. And it turned out that a lot of the answers that the people had given me, the stories they told me mapped pretty perfectly onto the ways that IEPs, not necessarily, but can be oppressive, right? Like they had said a lot of the things that were in this example IEP that I found from a particular uh, school district or a national organization. And this was a standard, not some supposedly hateful teacher doing this. This was like, here, you should use this as a sample. And so I was like, oh, I had no idea that everything I had been working on and put into the book would actually directly apply to one of the restrictions that I anticipated teachers coming to me with. And so I guess that showed the resonance of what people were saying, but also it showed how much these traits I focused on are used as weapons against us and how if they read the book and apply the things, they might actually be able to work against what's forced upon them. Thank you. Anyone else on that or I don't know if y'all are like me. Once I write a book, I have a really hard time going back and reading <laughs> what I've written. The same with the articles. I just feel so awkward. But occasionally when I do and I'm reading something I wrote, I'll see something. I'll be like, oh, yeah, 
Yeah, I made a really good point there. Has anybody had any of those moments with your book? Like, oh yeah, I, and I, I really captured that part well. <laughs> One thing that I'll say is that we looked at white racial identity development and then thought, well, if predominantly white institutions are made up predominantly of white people, then institutions too can have a white racial identity development. So we really looked at the ways that institutions replicate those stages of behavior. And I think from what I'm hearing from readers and from schools we're working with, that it's been a really useful sort of diagnostic tool. And I remember the moment we had that thought, you know, we were talking about white supremacy culture, how do we want to frame it? And then when we thought about schools having a racial identity, it just sort of fell into place. So I'm still pretty pleased about that. <laughs> I'd love to shout out my co-authors who are not here because they wrote some things that I was just like, you are brilliant. I am so lucky to be able to do this with you. Um, in teaching Asian America, um, my colleague Soyan An has been thinking about the ways that we can talk to young children about war, specifically the Philippine American War, or the Korean War and the Vietnam War, um, all of which are always told from like a US, this was, this was a thing that we needed to do for the sake of democracy around the world kind of lens. Um, and I, I admit to everyone, despite being a scholar of social studies, I do not like history and I certainly don't like war history. And reading Soyeon's description of the Korean War, I was like, that is the first thing I have read about the Korean War that's succinct and makes sense. And thank you for this gift of, of, of teaching me um, something that was always kind of nebulous and confusing to me, but she does it so well. It, it's beautiful. Um, and then in in Social Studies for a Better World, we have a chapter about what we describe as the problematic of dramatization and gamification, because we all know in elementary schools, the reenactment of the first Thanksgiving is just a thing that in some places will never go away. They just love it so much. And Katie just went all in on that chapter and just does a beautiful job. Um, Katie, I think, makes me such a better scholar because she's able to step back and really kind of look at the big picture and like categorize things. And she loves she loves like a diagram. And, and I my brain just doesn't work that way. And so when we were thinking through what would go in that chapter, she started doodling a flow chart, which we ended up putting in the book. And then it kind of walks you through, should I should I turn this into a game or dramatization and a bunch of decision making points? And then in the chapter, she writes out kind of at each point some of the different things that you should consider. And I just think it's so clear and concise um, and easy for, for people to be like, OK, yeah, no, I'm going to work my way through this and make some decisions. And so I think that was one chapter that she took the lead on and with the with the flow chart where I was like, your brain is beautiful. I don't understand how it works, but it is so helpful. And I think um, those two particular pieces of those two books were the ones where I was like, my God, my friends are so smart. So uh, I just wanted to highlight this. Well, I'll say having written with Katie, another thing she's really good at is metaphors, like using a metaphor to capture something. And I'm bad with metaphors. So she would come with some, with this metaphor and I'd be like, yeah, that that makes this make a lot more sense. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, we just have a, about a minute or so left. Um, I wonder if everybody, I wonder if I'm just kind of curious about this. Well, not everybody, but if you're if you're comfortable doing so. Does anybody have like, here are other books that need to be in a series like this? Maybe some topics of books. They, they might actually be topics. We have like, 10 or 12 other books signed already. <laughs> so, uh, but anybody have like, I'd like to see this book in this series? Or... Um, I have a feeling that this is among that uh, handful that you just referenced, but I'm really excited to see some, uh, a book or two about indigenous teaching in the series. And um, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited for that to join. I uh, I began my 
uh, research career looking at family involvement in Title I schools, in particular looking at how different demographics of parents construct their role beliefs or their thoughts about what they're supposed to do to help their child or children be successful. Um, and then when I moved and you know, got my tenure track job, I kind of switched my research line, but I would love to see a book that revisits family involvement through a lens of equity so we can think about how do teachers and schools um, send invitations to involvement that account for not only people's life context, skills, and knowledge, but that also accounts for what individual children need as opposed to come to open house and everybody do the same thing and it's just, it's it's not really effective. So I would love to see that. Anyone else, or, or are you afraid that if you come up with an idea that I'm going to expect you to write that book? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see something that focuses on supporting emergent bilingual students and immigrant students. I don't know if that's already in the works. Are we getting spoilers, Paul? Are we getting <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't want to mention possible things uh, before they're, you know, before we know that they're going to be completed. But I will say all of these topics so far are <laughs> related to things that, uh, that uh, have been signed? Uh, well, I would say, because I, I, I offer some sort of research suggestions at the end of the book, which is more academic because that is my background, like some of you. But as Noreen just mentioned, you know, I was a language teacher for several years before I moved into curriculum development and other things that I do in professional development, stuff like that now. And if I'm going to be on this beat, you know, the intersection between language and neurodivergence, that sort of thing, you know, just like there really is in the book on neurodivergence and race, there really isn't in the book on those two things put together, too. So uh, if I'm thinking of directions to go in the future, you know, since I have that experience, that's definitely something that needs to exist. Thank you. Well, um, I want to thank you all so much. Like I said, it just kind of makes me feel giddy to to be even just in the virtual room with all of you, and uh, because I've I've had just the honor of seeing these projects that were once just a paragraph of a description that were turned into these amazing books. Uh, I, I just feel so lucky and honored to have been able to step through uh, various parts of that process with such an amazing group of people. And uh, so I encourage anyone, if you're watching this, you know, uh, you won't be disappointed in these books. They're all, they're all just uh, amazing. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you again for joining us on this panel today. And thank you again to Paul for moderating for us. Um, really quickly, I want to let everyone know um, at the end of this video, we're going to share the link to the series page where you can explore the books that we've talked about today, um, order your copies, and then also be sure to keep an eye out for the two books that we have yet to come out later this year. Um, Alex Chevron Bennett's Becoming an Everyday Changemaker, which comes out next month, and JPB Gerald's um, Embracing the Exceptions, which comes out later this year in August. So please stay tuned for those, and thank you all again so much. <laughs>